started in this stuff? I first got interested in researching secret facilities and the black world in 1999 when I visited Area 51 and I saw all the security surrounding Area 51 and I realized how little um, solid information there is about Area 51. I just started digging and I started my website dreamlandresort.com where I'm putting information about Area 51, about black projects, to share that information with uh, other people that are interested in this. And there's a tremendous network of people interested in this stuff in there. It is. And what I really uh, didn't realize until I started my website is how many people are just sitting there in the woodworks and waiting for a focus point to um, come together and focus their efforts and focus their research. And I was lucky enough that Dreamland Resort became sort of a focus point for all these guys. Describe what's on the what's on the website. What do you got there? The website has a lot of information about Area 51, about Tonopah Test Range, about black projects, about the exercises that take place at Nellis, the red flag exercises. And we have a message board on the website where people can come and exchange their opinions, exchange whatever they figured out or what they think they figured out and where they can ask questions about Area 51. And we have a discussion, uh, we have a chat room where they can chat with other interested people. So we give them a way of communicating with others that share the same interest. You got a lot of guys who will go out there, like yourself, go out there, look around, take photos from public vantage points, not, not doing anything illegal, and then show the rest of the world what it looks like, right? Yeah, we, we have this loosely knit network of people that go out there and that uh, send us the information and photos and we put it up on the website to share it with everybody else who's looking for information about Area 51. Of course, there are risks. You were, you were friends with Chuck Clark. You know what happened to him. You were in communication with him back then when that, that stuff was going on, the sensors out there. Any risks right. to what you're doing? Actually, I was uh, not only in communications with Chuck at the time, but I was part of... Uh, Chuck and I went out there together some days and uh, discovered these road sensors. Um, for the most part, I'm trying to play it by the rules. I don't violate the border. I've never actually trespassed on uh, Air Force property or uh, into TTR or Area 51. Every once in a while, you get uh, some of the camos that get a little agitated about what we're doing. I had a couple of run-ins um, where they were really trying to play tough with me and intimidate me from uh, going any further. Uh, one of these occasions, I was going, I was hiking north of uh, the restricted area around White Sides, one of the uh, former view spots of Area 51, and they kept an eye on me for a while. And when I kept going about my business, eventually they just came basically driving their uh, off-road vehicle across the desert towards me and stopped right in front of me and tried to discourage me from going any further. Um, worldwide interest though, you get, you get people who are checking, logging onto your site from all over, the, all over the planet, right? Yes, we have people from all over the world. There's a lot of interest in the black projects, especially in Great Britain, in Europe, in, in Asia, I mean, people from all over the world check out the website and share the information and come with questions and uh, talk to our regulars. Uh, <laughs> let's talk about Tonopah. Uh, you ever heard uh, TTR referred to as Area 52? Yes, TTR is really referred to in official documents as Area 52. That all goes back to the really uh, this history of the Nevada test site when they were doing atomic tests in the 1950s on the Nevada test site and the whole test site was divided in areas and it just so happened that the area around Groom Lake and part of Papoos Lake was labeled as Area 51 for the purposes of uh, dividing this area in manageable areas and the area up uh, near Tonopah was uh, labeled as Area 52. I think most people don't realize that uh, Area 51 has a sister. Area 52. Right, there it is, Area 52. And it is actually in uh, public documents that are uh, readily available on the World Wide Web. Um, and is there, uh, what is the affiliation? There is an affiliation. Can you describe it? I mean, you know, sometimes things mm -hmm. go from 51 to 52, right? Black projects? Correct. Uh, on several occasions, actually, black projects moved from Area 51 to Tonopah Test Range. Area 51, of course, being a super secret facility, Tonopah Test Range being slightly less secret.
course, still a secret facility, but not this super secret facility. Uh, one such occasion was when uh, in the 1970s, there was a lot of research being done at Area 51 on Russian fighter jets. They were basically, they got their hands on these fighter jets. We don't want to talk about how they got them. And they were just playing with them. They were trying to figure out what can they do and what can they do, what, what can't they do? How can we beat them? And this project also moved on to Tonobar test range in a later stage when there was actually uh, pilots being trained at Tonopah test range to fly those Russian MiG jets, MiG-25, MiG-29, Su-27s um, for both um, tactical evaluation of those aircraft and also to participate in the red flag exercises. And F-117. Then the next big project that moved from Area 51 to Tonopah test range was the F-117 stealth fighter that was initially developed at Area 51 in s total secrecy and then it moved to Tonopah test range for tactical evaluation. Once it was flyable, once it was pretty much a developed um, a fighter jet, they moved it to Tonopah test range to figure out how to best fly it, how to best uh, use it, what can it do. And then of course it went public. Uh, you know, you had people like yourself, Jim Goodall, John Lear, folks like that, who knew it was flying around up there. Right. The people on Tonopah would see it for right. years and wouldn't talk about it. It was an open secret in Tonopah. And of course, Tonopah is such a small town that a lot of the locals depend on the business at Tonopah Test Range. So it was an open secret, but nobody would really talk about it in order to not jeopardize their source of income. Yeah, they don't want to kill the golden goose kind of a thing. Correct. And uh, of course, every once in a while, people would see them fly at night and they would report those flying triangles and uh, a lot of those were attributed to UFO sightings. Do you have any idea what's flying around up there now? Are there any kind of aircraft type programs or...? Yes, there's several different things going on at TTR at the moment. One of the things that are going on there and that have been going on there for a while is um, that they have these uh, huge radar ranges all around Tonopah test range where they're doing, where they're basically testing aircraft against different radar sites, a lot of them Russian in origin, where they're basically uh, trying to figure out how, do the, how can the Russians pick up our stealth fighters and what can we do about it, how can we improve the design. So a lot of it has to do with the electronic combat ranges around Tonopah Test Range. Another big thing at Tonopah Test Range right now is, and I'm fairly certain about this, um, they have uh, various types of UAVs that they are evaluating from a tactical standpoint. Um, they try to figure out how to best use them. Okay, we have these UAVs now, they're really cool to fly, and what can we do with them? How do we best use them? Because this is totally new technology, and we, are, we need to come up with whole new ways of using them. I've seen a reference to some sort of a special predator group. Yes, there's a whole squadron out there evaluating the Predator, which of course is housed at Indian Springs, very close by. Um, also doing performance tests. Um, how can we improve it? One of the things that came out of it um, was the Reaper, the big brother of the Predator, um, which is very similar in design, but much, much bigger, and it can carry a lot more payload. So they're, they're doing some stuff. Hey, let's figure out some secret stuff for Predator to do. We'll figure out if it works out there before right. we show it at Indian Springs. Right, I mean, we have these UAVs. They're really cool. We don't lose any pilots if that thing goes down. We don't have to worry about a lot of things. We don't have to worry about life support. They are much com more compact in design. Now let's figure out how we can best use them and yep. what we can use them for in addition to just recon reconnaissance missions. So radar, uh, UAVs, what else? Anything else come to mind um, that might that's, be going on out there? Really, the, the, the two big things. Another thing is that, uh, as of recently, the F-117 stealth fighters have been retired, and um, a lot of them are being put in storage at Tonopah test range, in the same hangars, incidentally, that they were put in when they were first flight tested out no there. Kidding. Yeah, yeah, there's all these, there's these rows, rows and rows of double hangars along the flight line that were used for the, uh, they are in a very secure, separate facility of the whole base, and they were used for the uh, F-117 stealth fighters during the 1980s, and that's actually where they end up again now 
to be put in storage. So if you're there and you're lucky and the hangar door is open, you can see one? You should be able to see right. You see one. Um, you know, it's confusing. As with as is the case with Area 51 for a long time, you can't figure out exactly is it is it uh, Air Force, is it CIA, is it DOE, and all of them have had interest in this thing. Explain who it is that has uh, control over uh, TTR. Unlike Area 51, which is managed by the U.S. Air Force. TTR is managed by Sandia National Laboratories, a private contractor firm, which contracts out its services to various branches of the military and also to the Department of Energy. You've seen over the years that Sandia has done, there's a lot of work done on behalf of DOE at Tonopah on nuclear weapons type things, triggers and that sort of thing, right? That's what they do. That's what Sandia is really big in, in the business of uh, doing the non-nuclear um, parts of a nuke basically and this is a great area where they can test these parts because they have not only the Tonopah test range but then they have the whole Nevada test site in the south of it where they can blow stuff up and nobody even cares. Yeah, so it's almost interchangeable they can they can use Nellis range they can use I guess I guess all these guys work together on all this stuff sometimes uh, it's DOE sometimes it's Air Force. Absolutely they totally work together they it's not necessarily that uh, the one hand knows what the other does. There's uh, compartmentalization going on, of course, but they help each other out as much as they can. And so, yes, absolutely, they share their facilities. And uh, a lot of the facilities inside the Nevada test site are really um, managed by Sandia. It's about Sandia. Now, there are some people who refer to Sandia as separate from TTR. Is there any kind of separation? Is there a different facility than what we know as the TTR base and a Sandia base? To the best of my knowledge, there is no separation. TTR, the base that is often referred to as TTR, really is only part of the whole range. Right. The range is managed by Sandia.